Welcome and thanks for joining. I have two things I want to say before I jump into the presentation. First, there are timestamps in the description box for different parts of the video in case you want to skip to or repeat a specific section. And second, as you are probably already aware, there is a live Zoom meeting you can join if you have any questions after you watch the video. Okay, I think that's it, so let's get into it. The title of this presentation is Assessment of Mycobacterium Species Strain ELW1's Co-Metabolic Capabilities for Environmental Contaminants. And that is kind of a mouthful, so I'm going to break that down a little bit. Starting with Mycobacterium Strain ELW1. ELW1 is a strain of mycobacterium that was isolated from the sediment of a stream on the campus of North Carolina State University by Dr. Michael Hyman and his research group. ELW1 was isolated by enrichment culture using isobutene, a hydrocarbon gas with a double bond, as the sole carbon and energy source. Now let's talk about co-metabolic capabilities. Actually, let's just talk about co-metabolism. Co-metabolism is the microbially mediated transformation of a compound that does not yield carbon or energy that supports microbial growth. You can think of it as kind of an accidental transformation of sorts. Enzymes expressed by microorganisms to use its growth substrate can also sometimes degrade xenobiotic compounds present in the environment. In this case, ELW1 expresses a monooxygenase that it uses to initially oxidize its primary substrate, isobutene, to 1,2-epoxy-2-methylpropane, which is this compound. This epoxide is then hydrolyzed and further oxidized in elw one central metabolic pathway, which gives ELW1 energy to thrive and grow. Now, in the case of co-metabolism, a compound that is not isobutene but still resembles it in some way finds its way into the active site of the monooxygenase. It's transformed by this enzyme, but the cell doesn't get anything out of this. From ELW1's perspective, this process is useless, but for environmental engineers who are, say, looking to remediate contaminated soil and groundwater, this process might be very useful. Finally, let's talk about environmental contaminants. Now, this is a very broad category by design, as I didn't want to give too much away in the title, but I'm looking at two classes of compounds in particular here, CAHs and PAHs. These sound deceptively similar, but they're actually very different. CAHs are chlorinated aliphatic hydrocarbons, things like chlorinated solvents, that were used extensively in the 20th century for things like metal degreasing and dry cleaning. And PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, a collection of compounds that are released from activities like burning fuel or natural phenomena such as wildfires. These are still really broad categories, so I'm going to narrow down the discussion even further to just two compounds, cis-DCE, a CAH, and phenanthrene, a PAH. Like many other CAHs, cis-DCE is a dense non-aqueous phase liquid. This means that when disposed of improperly or spilled, cis-DCE would actually percolate down through the soil and reach the groundwater. And since it's somewhat water soluble, we now have a contamination problem in the groundwater. So where does ELW1 come in? Well, remember that monooxygenase that ELW1 uses to degrade isobutene? Previous work done with ELW1 demonstrated ELW1's capability to degrade many CAHs, including cis-DCE, via co-metabolism using this monooxygenase. So this was a nice starting place to pick back up on. A resting cell rate test was performed to determine the rate at which ELW1 could degrade cis-DCE and ELW1's capacity, or how much cis-DCE a given amount of ELW1's biomass was able to degrade. In this test, glass bottles with butyl septa caps were prepared with a liquid media volume of 100 ml and a gas volume of 55 ml. A saturated solution of cis-DCE in water was injected into the bottles along with an ELW1 cell concentrate. The bottles were then placed on a shaker table in a 30 degrees Celsius room to ensure equilibrium between the gas and liquid phase, and the headspace was analyzed over time using gas chromatography with an electron capture detector. This monitored the cis-DCE concentration in the gas phase. This could then be used to determine the liquid phase concentration using Henry's Law. And with all of this information, the rate and capacity could be calculated. 
Here you are seeing the disappearance of cis-DCE in milligrams over time. The spikes you see are the subsequent additions of cis-DCE to the bottles. The first order rate is representative of the transformation rate for the first cis-DCE spike in the three active bottles. Now, what's different with this experiment compared to the previous work is that, thanks to the sensitivity of the ECD detector, we can also track the formation and disappearance of the cis-DCE epoxide formed by the monooxygenase. It looks pretty similar to the epoxide we saw before with isobutene, right? This is the same graph you saw before, but now the cis-DCE epoxide is also shown by the dotted lines for each active bottle. The epoxide data corresponds to the secondary y-axis of peak area divided by 10. Since we can measure the cis-DCE epoxide in the bottles now, we can investigate whether or not its disappearance is also due to ELW1's enzymatic activity. The experiment to test this was set up very similarly to the previous one, but I'm not so concerned about the rate of cis-DCE degradation this time. Instead, I'm looking for the accumulation of the cis-DCE epoxide. One significant accumulation of cis-DCE epoxide was achieved. A monooxygenase inhibitor, 1-octine, was added to half of the bottles. Now, in these bottles, whatever transformation occurs is not due to the monooxygenase activity. I could then follow the cis-DCE epoxide in both the active bottles and inhibited bottles to see if the epoxide disappearance occurred at different rates. Here, you are seeing the cis-DCE epoxide plotted as peak area decrease over time. The black arrow indicates the time at which one octine was added into the bottles. As it turns out, there is a significant difference between the rate of epoxide disappearance in active bottles and inhibited bottles. This leads us to believe that the disappearance of cis-DCE epoxide is due, at least in part, to ELW1's enzymatic activity. All right, if you remember from the beginning of the video, I mentioned two classes of compounds we would talk about. We spent a lot of time looking at CAHs, so now let's turn our attention to PAHs. They don't have a strong resemblance to isobutene or cis-DCE, as they're aromatic instead of aliphatic. Can ELW1's monooxygenase even co-metabolize a PAH, say phenanthrene? Well, before I give that answer away, let's look at the compounds again. What do isobutene and cis-DCE have in common? A double bond. And if we look at the metabolites of these two compounds, an epoxide is formed at the location of the double bond. Now, here's phenanthrene. And look, a double bond. Actually, there's a lot of them. So even though the compounds look very different structurally, the presence of double bonds in all of them is a hint that the monooxygenase may transform PAHs as well. Previous work done with ELW1 and phenanthrene demonstrated that ELW1 is in fact capable of co-metabolizing phenanthrene, which is great. ELW1 produced many hydroxylated transformation products, some of which were not able to be identified. Unfortunately, when the mixture of the co-metabolic transformation products was tested for toxicity with zebrafish models, it was revealed that the mixture produced by ELW1 was actually more toxic to the zebrafish than the reconstructed mixture of the identified co-metabolic products. It was hypothesized that the unidentified co-metabolic products contributed to the increased toxicity. Since we don't want to create more problems when trying to remediate contaminated sites, it is important that we find a remediation strategy or combination of strategies that minimizes the formation of these toxic products. Therefore, ELW1 can still play an important role in the remedial efforts for PAHs, but other methods may be employed in parallel or sequence with bioremediation to ensure the efforts are as successful as possible. And that is the direction this research is heading. I would like to acknowledge the National Institute of Environmental Health and Safety's Superfund Research Program for funding this research, and a special thank you to Dr. Semprini for advising this research and Dr. Michael Hyman for providing the ELW1 peer culture to the Semprini lab. All right, that concludes the content for this video. Thank you so much for your attention, and I really hope you enjoyed.